So I'm going to record this video with little hope that I will in any way change the mind of uh, David Long, who I've been engaged in um, an exchange with for about a year now, I believe it was last August, um, that we began um, a series of volleys uh, critiquing one another's thought. Um, David also likes to, it's not just me, it's a pattern with many of the people that he engages with. Um, he likes to wage an all-out assault on someone's character and reputation. Um, I'm not the only one to point this out. I think it's it's a fair assessment, despite you know my own bias being someone who he has attacked. I think it's a fair assessment of his uh, behavior more generally, and the evidence is um, available uh, online on YouTube, on Facebook, uh, for anyone to um, verify. But I want to focus on the ideas here. Um, David won't agree with me. David will continue to mischaracterize and I think probably misunderstand my position and the position of the philosophical traditions, schools of thought figures that I sometimes reference, and this is a point of contention for David. He calls it name dropping, and um, to my mind, there's a, and you know, as a result of my training, there's a ethics of citation, an ethics of knowledge production, really, which is basically that, yeah, you cite your sources, and by referencing a source, um, one is not simply appealing to authority, one is rather situating themselves within a, um, a history of discourse. In other words, situating oneself within an ongoing conversation where, to a large extent, terms have been established, distinctions have been marked, and, you know, there's a whole series of um, responses building upon uh, one another, right? So one references a source, whether an individual or a school of thought, in order to provide context. And this is a matter of contention for David because he claims that the only thing warranted um, in conversations about, I don't know, contemporary science, but also metaphysics and natural philosophy, the only sorts of claims which are justified for David are those which are, he will often say, um, established in a ground up logical way based on principles um, in light of the available evidence, right? Okay. I think, you know, by and large, we would always want to justify our um, our claims, our philosophies. But David, and he has himself said that he wants to follow a kind of Cartesian methodology. Um, he claims to be an epistemological foundationalist, I, I guess, though when he describes what it means to, you know, follow in Descartes' footsteps, um, I don't get the sense that it, uh, that David is really um, aligning himself with Descartes' actual method. I don't recognize Descartes in the way David describes the method, but in any event, David does want to uphold this foundationalist sort of epistemology where one grounds the possibility of knowledge in certain, I guess, indubitable um, premises or principles. And, you know, I think... Strangely enough, I mean, there's a way to read the whole Cartesian tradition, including Immanuel Kant, who is an idealist, as um, foundationalist in the way that David appears to be describing. In other words, Kant wanted to make logic, transcendental logic, of course, which is a little bit different than, you know, an Aristotelian conception of logic, but nonetheless, Kant wants to make logic a priori, and he wants to say that, you know, we can lay out the principles, he calls them categories, um, and show how they are self-justifying and how, in fact, we couldn't um, 
have any of the knowledge of the natural world that we gain through science unless these epistemological principles were true a priori, that is necessarily and universally of any um, you know, knowledge claim we might make about objects in space and time. And so, um, you know, this is to say that foundationalism as an epistemological approach is um, typically idealist. And David Long claims to be attacking idealism because he thinks that it is essentially reducible to a form of creationism. For David, all idealism really says at the end of the day is God did it. I mean, I'm summarizing here, but I think it's a fair um, depiction of what David imagines idealism to be arguing. Um, but then he goes and claims foundationalism as his epistemic approach, and so is thereby incriminating his own approach as idealist, right? Because the question, of course, is, um, for even for Kant, who didn't pretend that God was a being we could have any knowledge about, um, you know, if, even for Kant, like, we can't really question the source of these ideas, these, these categories, these principles that in a sort of ground-up way establish the, or, or justify um, his epistemological method, justify our knowledge of the scientific um, or justify our scientific knowledge. And so uh, where do these categories, these principles come from? Um, they just come from logic, which is, I mean, Kant will say it's apodictic, right? It's self-evident. And this, would, this is what makes it, um, you know, subject to analysis. You know, the, there's a clear step-by-step -step pathway to follow. And um, But why it is that there should be this sort of rationality in, in, in existence, you know, Kant really, he just has to presuppose it, right? And there's clearly a theological background there. And so David's not wrong, you know, to point out the theological background of idealism, but I do think he's wrong to so quickly dismiss it because again, he himself is um, apparently aligning himself with an idealistic epistemology. Now, what I've been trying to argue in favor of, against David's position, is a different conception of truth and epistemology, which comes out of American pragmatism. Um, Charles Saunders, Peirce, William James are the big names here, and of course Whitehead will later in inherit this epistemological method and extend it into ontology and metaphysics. I mean, Peirce already did that, James did as well in, in his own way, but Whitehead really, I think, brings a kind of systematic, coherent application of this pragmatic uh, epistemology. Um, he, he expands it into metaphysics in a way that it hadn't been done before, but the pragmatist approach to knowledge is an attempt to naturalize epistemology. Uh, in other words, to understand our knowledge of what is true based on an evolutionary process that would be um, in some way related to our biological uh, physiology, right? Our, our, our neuro, um, physical, physiological uh, activity. We want to understand knowledge in the context of an evolved and evolving organism. Now, of course, for Peirce, James, and Whitehead, um, evolution is not simply a mechanical Darwinian process. There is natural selection, but there are other forms of selection and evolution, including the choices made by the organisms that are evolving, right? And so um, a pragmatic understanding of truth recognizes that the capacity for truth has to have, ev have evolved, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, and so there must have been a process of selection that gradually allowed the epistemic um, verification of knowledge, this sort of thing that philosophers and, and scientists do, um, to allow that to be possible, right, for a biological creature. Now, I think Nietzsche was among the earliest to point out that um, if evolution is true, if there's a descent of species, even if organisms do have some um, sway 
in the matter. They're not merely lumbering robots, as Richard Dawkins would say, but no, even Darwin admitted like sexual selection, right? The preference of animals has a role to play in how they develop phenotypes. <clears throat> but if there is an evolutionary process at all of common descent, Nietzsche pointed out that, well, this, this has epistemological implications, right? Truth is then not some reality independent of appearance because where organisms are sensory organs evolved uh, to allow us to survive and to thrive, right? And so they didn't evolve to mirror a reality that we imagine to be independent of the process that gave rise to us. So in other words, this notion of an objective material world out there, separate from our organism, from our life, from our perceptual experience, that our epistemology would then allow us to mentally represent, right? That whole idea, which is what Descartes presupposes, and the whole Cartesian tradition is trying to work through and arriving at various paradoxes, right? That whole idea arrives at paradoxes like the hard problem of consciousness because it's incoherent. You know, it's separating mind from matter in a way that an evolutionary epistemology doesn't do anymore. And so truth becomes something, we have to say, something that is enacted from a pragmatist point of view. Truth is an event which occurs. Um, it's intersubjective in its very essence, which is not to say it's merely relativistic in the sense that it's whatever um, a, group of, a group of people decide they want it to be. No, truth is intersubjective in the Whiteheadian sense um, that there's always a community or a society of beings, some human, but most not human, like all of the cells that compose our bodies, they all also contribute to the event or the enactment of truth. Um, the molecules composing those cells are also in Whitehead's scheme. Um, part of the, they're, they're, they're among the epistemic agencies who are participating in this enactment of truth. So it's not just a human projection or an agreement among humans that makes something true. It's an agreement among this entire biotic and ultimately cosmic community of organisms or centers of experience that agree on what is true to allow the truth to manifest as, as an event, right? And so truth in this sense becomes not relativistic in the postmodern sense that David, you know, would rightly want to critique. No, truth becomes relational in a fully cosmological sense and biological sense in that um, for the event of truth to arise, there needs to be a cooperation among a variety of beings in the world within which that truth is arising. That's basically all I wanted to add.